Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Design Expo. Uh, yay! <laughs> so this is the 10th year uh, we did the Design Expo. I'm just going to talk for about five minutes and give you a little bit of, of an overview. And then each of our nine schools is going to do a quick uh, presentation, about a 10-minute presentation, and then get some feedback from our critics. And if we have time, get some questions from the audience. So we started this. Um, really, I mean, one of the things that we get out of this is Every year we identify a problem or a challenge. This year it's um, making data useful. And I think one of the things that we do by giving this challenge to all these schools is we really learn um, the student perspective, you know, across different cultures, different skills, and sort of different ages, uh, you know, what might be some interesting problems and solutions um, to the challenge that we give them. And then, of course, one of our goals is to really build long-term relationships with the schools. Some of the schools have done this, you know, many, many times. Every year we rotate schools, so every year we also have new schools. And I think over the last 10 years we've had about 50 or 60 um, top schools pretty much from every place you could imagine participate. Um, and so, uh, so welcome. Uh, just a little bit on the process. Um, usually in the fall, we actually select schools and professors. We work with the design community across Microsoft. And then each school actually holds a semester-long course in the spring on this topic. And there's a lot of work that never comes here. They have a lot of projects that um, don't get selected to come here. Each school probably has about four or five projects just in their school. Um, they pick a project to come out, and together with their faculty, they come out and they present this together as part of the faculty summit. Um, so, you know, if you have other questions about any other, other projects, make sure you uh, meet the faculty and talk to them and hear a little bit more about the schools because the curriculum and schools and programs are, are really awesome. Um, so this is um, the challenge. Uh, one of the things that we did, a few of the people who participated in the past uh, emailed me and they were saying, you know, Clay and I think the school from Israel were saying, you know, well, what's the challenge going to be? And I said, I don't, I don't know. What would you recommend? And so we always um, collaborate and work with our faculty to try to pick topics that are really relevant um, in the schools. And this year it's making data useful and really how does that um, how might, there's so much data around, there's so much talk about big data, but how might um, a single person, an individual, or a small group of people, or maybe a city sort of experience the data in a way that's really impactful and meaningful? Um, and, uh, you know, today, of course, we're just at the beginning, and so I think you'll be pretty excited by how the students have sort of interpreted this challenge. So just kind of want to give you this as sort of an eye test if you can read. Um, but um, just wanted to let you know these are the schools that are participating. I'll just quickly um, name them. Um, and the professor, if you could just stand up and wave, um, that'd be great. Uh, we also have a liaison from a different group across Microsoft who's gone there all semester long and has spent a lot of time this week sort of working with the students. So um, first, uh, we'll have NYU. Clay Shirky is the professor there. Yay! <laughs> Uh, from IDC, the Interdisciplinary um, Center, the MeLab in Israel, we have Oren Zuckerman and Noah Moik. Um, from Carnegie Mellon, the School of Design, we have Peter Scufelli and Bruce Hannington. By the way, they have on their team shirts, so good team spirit. Uh, from UCLA. Um, we have uh, the Digital Media Arts Center, so it's Christian Muller and Sue Hyun Kim and Casey Rees, but I think their professors weren't able to make it, so, but they're awesome. Uh, and then at the top, we go to Eindhoven from the Netherlands, the ID group, and we have Barry Egan. Um, from India, we have the National Institute of Design, or NID, um, so it is Rupesh. Uh, first time in the Design Expo, we have North Umbria from the UK with Trevor Duncan. 
Um, Ibo Americana from Mexico City, um, Jorge Meza Aguilar. And University of Washington, um, Axel Rossler. All right, so with that, we're going to start off. Oh, almost forgot. We also have three critics. Um, so what we do is we have the students present, and then we'll get a little feedback. And we have some awesome, awesome critics. Um, Tony Dunn from the Royal College of Art. Uh, Daryl Bishop. Daryl and I were actually interns together at Apple a million years ago. And we're students when we saw this starting. And um, Bill Buxton. And then uh, behind stage there, he's, I think he's listening. I can see him. Mike Kasparov from Trapeze, my partner in crime, and sort of pulls this together and makes this happen. He's hiding this. He's a partner in crime. He's criminal. All right, so that's it for me. Um, have fun. Uh, students have worked really hard. And we'll kick it off with NYU. Hey, what's up? Um, my name is Omel. This is uh, Donna. This is Carl. And this is Michael. Uh, we're on Facebook. Um, this is actually how we see ourselves on Facebook. Four different personas. Like this is the Im these are the images that we see, and this is really important because we're about to present to you uh, Mine. Mine is a service that allows you to see yourself the way that data miners see you. Now, if I were giving this presentation when we started six months ago. I would have to explain what data mining is and convince you that you're being tracked. I don't think I have to do this now. Uh, the Snowden case showed us that actually uh, you know, governments without any problems can get a lot of your data. What it didn't show you is that companies can do the same thing with relative ease. So let's talk about data miners for a minute. You know what? Let's not talk about data miners. Let's talk about Sharon. She's Carl's sister. She's 31. She's single. Um, and she's, be, she's looking for a house. Looking for a house means that she's looking for a mortgage. And looking for a mortgage means uh, something completely different than what it meant 15 years ago. Because Sharon uses Foursquare. Whenever she checks into a pub, someone is making a note of it and selling it to her health insurance. That's worth money. That's a transaction. That's worth money. She also uses Facebook. So whenever she takes uh, a picture that's embarrassing, you know, it gets sell, sold to an HR firm, an HR firm takes it and sells it to her next employer. Also, when she tweets about spending, her bank makes note. Remember that mortgage? The other thing is like, she also uses, you know, she can use LinkedIn, Tumblr, multiple Tumblrs. Um, that's all worth money. This is an entire ecosystem which one, one member is missing, the creator of the ego system. She is not seeing any of that. That is not her property. We want to change that. We want to give Sharon back her identity. We want to give back her data. So giving Sharon the, back the power of her own data is where we started with mine. We wanted to help Sharon understand how others see her. We wanted to show her how she might be able to use that to alter her persona a bit, to, to protect herself online. We spoke to uh, over 150 people, both, both in online questionnaires in Mechanical Turk and also with in-person interviews. And we, we asked questions uh, based on our own social media that we volunteered, such as the following. Here's Carl. We have two versions of Carl. <laughs> and we asked, which man would you invest, it, uh, invest with? rather, The bunny man on the right or the serious, thoughtful guy on his first date, maybe? Um, we thought that the man on the left would be the winner, but over 70% of our respondents said that the bunny man was the man they would invest with because he seemed more sociable, amiable, and maybe even more able to get money for the enterprise. Um, we also used negative images such as these. We said, which of these women would you, would you, um, would you want to lend your cell phone to? And we thought, again, the mean-looking but serious one might be more prone to give it back to you. Um, however, it was the drunk woman who seemed to need it more, and most people responded they would lend their phone to her, which was kind of an uplifting surprise. Um, 
Here we, we also did some single questions, open-ended questions, to see if we could tease out a different kind of insight. Here we asked, did we, uh, you know, would you invest in this man? And most of the people we talked to said, uh, well, if he were doing a startup, they might invest with him. But if they were uh, getting into a hedge fund or a mutual fund, forget it. Something that we found in these interviews was the power of assumptions and judgments that people bring with them when they're reviewing the social media of those they don't know. But with the comparison pictures, we found something interesting. We discovered that actually um, we might be able to use what we got from those to create a kind of uh, bubble sort of opinion that we could use to um, possibly enable people to create that elusive quantified selfie. Thanks, Donna. So through our process, we learned a few things, one of which was that context really matters. Yes, that's me on the left. Um, aside from the Jersey Shore-esque style of the photo on the left, it actually humanizes the data on the right. If you were just to see a bunch of check-ins at bars every night of the week, you might assume the worst. But in fact, looking at the photo, it's just friends getting together and hanging out. We also learned that people need buffers. Gmail has Undo Send. You have Medium, which is a personal publishing platform that lets you post to just a few select people before you go completely public. So our goal at mine is to be that buffer, but for your social media. We learned one last thing. That like 10 years ago, when people were ready to come together on Facebook, Snowden and other events that have happened as of late have created this community, this community that wants to get together, help each other, and protect their data. Mine can be the force that brings this community together. So those were the goals in mind that we thought of when we were creating our interface. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so Omer talked about these big machine automated data miners. And then Donna talked about these humans that are judging each other one on one. And we went through this whole design process. And now we'd like to show you what we came up with. So when you first launched mine, you have to plug in all your different social networks. The more you give us, the better we can help you. Um, so once you hook it all up, you click Make It Mine, and then you're brought to this first part. So a mine analysis consists of two parts. You have a machine analysis and a human analysis. The machine analysis, you know, as soon as you hook up your data, your different social networks, uh, it breaks it down into different attributes that it notices about you. The first one is the most prominent, and then it goes down. Uh, to less prominent ones, and it breaks it down into posts. Uh, those are just normal posts, you know, talking about what you had for lunch. Uh, <laughs> facts, these are a number of check-ins, the types of places you checked into, and then assumptions, and these are the types of things that data miners would uh, assume about you based on your, diff your data. So, the next part is this human analysis. And so the human analysis, you have to select which attributes you would like to highlight and hide in your social media profile. So in this case, this person wants to look more influential, and so they drag it over to highlight. So then they can see how they stack up. So a part of mine is this uh, karma system. So you might see this in online dating sites and hot or not. Uh, you go through and you do the side-by-side A-B -side analysis mm -hmm. that we found in our uh, user research. And so in this case, this person wants to appear more sociable, so Sharon, if she's using this, clicks that one. And then you do this over and over again until you put enough karma back into the system. Then you get your human analysis here. This is a breakdown based on what the attributes she specified re uh, previously. Um, and so she scrolls down. The green plus there is things that she was highlighting, and the minus is things that she's hiding. So in this day and age where data mining is not a problem, it's a reality, uh, and nobody's looking out for your data, you should let mine be your canary. Boom. All right, you guys have a couple. Um, actually, is this working? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm not sure, I'm really, sorry, it's, it's just, I'm just being jumped into it like this. Um, How's it going? 
<laughs> it's interesting. Hi there. Um, so, at what point do um, at what point, um, if you're competing against a system, does the system then start competing back against you? How do you feel about? Um, uh, well. So uh, the thing is, um, you know, it's an, arm, it's an arms race as long as you maintain it that way. Like, um, data mining is usually is between machines. It's kind of like if you think of high frequency trading, it's sort of the same way. Like, I data mine, then you hide something. We're trying to cap that. We're trying to say data mining is a reality. Use that in order to, um, you know, you can face your data miner and say, this is the information I'm serving you and no more. This is the order that I'm serving this to you, and I know all of this, so I'm not afraid of what I'm posting. I would not be surprised when it appears on my HR report. That's what we were after. We were after capping this arms race at a certain point. And it's possible that um, if, if things get to the point where we have no, where there's no data because everyone's hiding, maybe we can start to make money from our data. If <laughs> miners want it, then they can pay for it. I think, and, oh, sorry. I was going to say, I just think the real value is, I know there's always mm -hmm. this back and forth, I think the real value is the community, that if they come together, I don't know if there's an escalation from that point, because it's just then helping each other out, and being that kind of impenetrable force that, like, okay, if something, retraining each other yeah. to be more mindful of what they post. That was not a tenant pun, but... <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely, mind their own business. definitely <laughs> a behavioral aspect to it. So, so I... <clears throat> So thanks for the presentation. Mm -hmm. And this, it, I like it because it, it's confrontational in an interesting way about something that's important. And I, I think it, just in the very title, the double meaning of mm -hmm. mining versus its mine yeah. is, is well chosen and, and, and plays to the point. I'm, I'm confused in some sense as to w whether the objective is to help give me some reflection of myself back so I might control my own image um, in terms of what I make available, or whether at the back end some way, and this is the part I don't understand, is that how this would prevent information or data about me from being captured by a uh, mind elsewhere. Because if we were going to make money and keep it private, I don't, I haven't grasped where um, where the g firewall is that lets my stuff be mine until I give it to yeah. you. Or well, right. certain stakeholders like Facebook. They have all the data anyway, so you can't really do a lot there. And even if you delete it, they already know yeah. what you had. <laughs> so yeah. uh, this part of the system is it's a one-time process. It informs the user about what sort of assumptions are being made so that they might make better decisions in the future. Now, we didn't design this in this sense that uh, this follows up in the future, say, regular intervals that send you email updates like, hey, you did this. But uh, that's, there's potential for that. Um, but the best we can do today is just, you know, educate the user and give them the control to uh, hide or obfuscate or maybe yeah. delete things that, uh, you know, somebody like maybe a third party network would not have access to otherwise. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> There's a third. Did you get the canary in the coal mine? Pardon? Yeah, the canary in the coal mine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's a really provocative thought. I mean, you wanted to see yourself, see what you get as results.